Okay, well, thank you to the organisers for inviting me. And why on earth do I want to talk to you about mass-producing stem cells today? Well, really, it's because stem cells have this great potential um, to be therapies, therapies that we can use, um, for hopefully, to treat lots of different um, diseases. But also, because I'm really passionate about telling you a little bit more about the fact that, A, they're really hard to manufacture, and the fact that actually manufacturing is not quite what you think it is. So, what is manufacturing? It's really about how we make and produce things. And I think that logically, you're all smart here in the room, you can understand that actually, you know, whether you're trying to make a car or whether you're trying to make shampoo or a drug, the processes and facilities involved in that must be really different. And yet, if you actually look for images of manufacturing, this is what you get. Cogs. Welding, sort of, you know, symbols that indicate that it's dirty, polluting. We've got, you know, smokestacks and things like that. And what I want to do today is I want to show you that actually you can do manufacturing in a really different kind of setting. One that looks a little bit more like this. And what we've got here is it's a facility in the US that's actually all about making therapies based on cells. You can see that you've got you know, separate rooms for separate activities. You can see it's a very clean environment. People are wearing what we affectionately call these bunny suits. Not sure where the term came from, but you know, that help actually stop contamination from us, things like hair, skin cells, get into the product, i.e. the cells that we're actually going to then put into patients, because that's really important when you're thinking about how you're actually going to um, use these products. So that's a really different environment. It looks quite small scale as well, and it is at the moment, because actually this is not something that we're routinely using um, at the moment, so that's just reflected here. But that kind of cleanliness and that whole environment is obviously something that's broader to healthcare manufacturing on the whole. So here are just some examples. We've got um, down on the left-hand side there, the National um, Health Service and Blood Transfusion Centre down in Filton near Bristol, which is all about how they take donated blood, individual bags of that, and process it for um, further use. And you can see that's a kind of similar um, setting. Or we can go much larger scale to the one here on the right, where we've got these kind of large tanks where we're going to be making biopharmaceuticals. Uh, and I have to say as well, just before we move on, that um, lots of these images were taken from news stories. So there isn't usually a man with a video camera trying to track what happens to your donated blood. That's just kind of a one-off. <laughs> but, you know, why stem cells? Why are they kind of my favourite cell? And yes, I'm a geek, I've got a favourite cell. <laughs> it's because, you know, they can have really good therapeutic potential. And we kind of have the strap line of saying they can cure the incurable. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in just a minute. But hopefully, you're all aware that you guys right now, me included, are all made up of billions of cells. And they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, like you can see just there. And they have lots of different functions. So your heart cells, they can actually beat together. And that's what gives that heart muscle the ability to then pump blood around the body. You have cells in your gut right now, because we're not far after lunch, um, that are secreting things like enzymes that are helping you break down food. Whereas other cells in your gut are then made to absorb all of those nutrients. So they're all really different. But unfortunately, whether it's through accidents, whether it's through um, various diseases, acute or chronic ones, or whether it's just simply through aging, those cells and the tissues and organs that they make up can actually start to fail and um, no longer function properly. And normal drugs and therapies, they tend to deal with the symptoms, things like pain. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for that, because I can't deal with any pain whatsoever. But there's a need actually to think about things like type 1 diabetes. Does anybody here have a family member who's got diabetes? Okay, one or two hands. Basically, in type 1 diabetes, the organ is called the pancreas that produces insulin, which is a really important um, hormone in your body that helps you take the glucose that's in your bloodstream and put it and have it be absorbed by your cells. And that's really important because it then becomes energy for you. Well, it no longer produces enough of that or any of it at all. And that means that people who've got this type 1 diabetes have to inject themselves daily, in fact, several times a day, with insulin. As somebody who's completely scared by needles, that sounds like a horrible idea. The fact I'd have to do it for the rest of my life sounds even worse. So actually, wouldn't it be great if all we could do is put in some new cells, a new organ, a new pancreas, that would then create that insulin on an as-needs basis without having to sort of, you know, have daily injections? And really, that's what regenerative therapies or regenerative medicine is all about. And stem cells, and this is why I think they're really cool, is just one form of that regenerative um, therapy. So, what are they? Well, they're immature cells. So what that means is they're not specialized in any way. So they're not heart cells, they're not liver cells. 
but they have the potential to become all of these because they have that potential to do something we call differentiation, but it basically means that they are maturing. The other thing is that they've got this power to self-renew. They can clone themselves. And we'll see why that's really useful a little bit later on. What this kind of says to me, though, and, and this is just a little image that we had created for um, our sort of a regenerative medicine blog um, that we've created um, here as part of some of the work we do at Loughborough, is you kind of think, oh, stem cells just sat around going, oh, what do I want to be today? But actually, no. The body's very controlling about what stem cells are allowed to become. And that's because, I've just said, you know, insulin it is in your bloodstream. Wherever the cells detect it, they can then absorb insulin, uh, glucose. They're responding to that chemical cue that insulin is. Well, stem cells are just the same. They can respond to various chemical cues, to physical cues that are in their environment. And so it means that if they're sat in the liver, they know that they're surrounded by liver cells and they will only ever become liver. You don't suddenly get a bone cell in the middle of your liver or a heart cell in the middle of your liver. So that's um, really important. So it's recognizing that actually it's not just about putting, you know, taking those potential stem cells, potentially in the lab, turning them into a cell of interest. So have we got the power to take a stem cell, turn it into a cell that produces insulin and transplant it back into the body? Well, yes, we're working towards that. But there's more than that. We can also potentially take stem cells and use them as a therapy instead. So who here has heard of a bone marrow transplant? Okay, the vast majority of you. And now you're thinking, well, what does a bone marrow transplant have to do with stem cells? An awful lot, actually. Because the bone marrow is a really complex substance. It's got lots of different goodies in it. And one of those goodies is called a hematopoietic stem cell. I'll try saying that three times in a row. But hematopoietic stem cells are really critical to you, me, and everybody. Because they are the cells that turn into, they mature, and become your blood cells. So they become your red blood cells that help you carry oxygen through your body. And they become the white blood cells that help you fight off infection. And unfortunately, if you're given something like a very strong chemotherapy drug or radiotherapy, something like that for cancer, those cells can become damaged and they no longer function properly. What a bone marrow transplant allows us to do is replace those hematopoietic stem cells so the patient has the ability once again to produce their own blood cells. And that's really, really critical. It's not all about diabetes and cancer, although clearly they're really kind of big global health um, issues, but it's also about treating patients um, with potential eye injuries, with spinal cord injuries, cardiac problems, and um, so forth. And so I suppose it's kind of thinking about who can we treat? Is this just going to be, you know, a couple of people? Are we treating hundreds? Well, we've got different options. We can either take stem cells from a patient, do some processing, and put them back into that patient. Or we can take cells from a donor and then pass them on to a patient. And that's often what happens with bone marrow transplants. Or we can take cells from one donor and then potentially treat hundreds of people. And to, to me and other researchers, that's a really exciting prospect. Because suddenly, a stem cell therapy becomes something that's like a drug. It can be sitting on a shelf and it can potentially treat lots of people whenever they need it. We might no longer have to wait for you know, a donor to become available, for their cells to be processed, etc. But there's this, a really big challenge around actually how do we mass produce those cells? And I'm going to get onto why that's the case very shortly. So how do we go from cells in patient all the way back to putting cells in another patient? It's quite a complex process. We have to take a sample from a patient. And in that sample, like in the bone marrow, it's not just going to have stem cells in it. You're going to have to get rid of some of those other bits and pieces that we don't need anymore. So we're going to isolate, in this case, a little green stem cell. We're then going to think about how we can create more stem cells. And this is where that self-renewing property that I mentioned comes in. Because actually, we can take um, stem cells, we can put them into these flasks. They come about this big. And what then happens is you put a sort of nutrient-filled liquid on top of them, and they grow and grow and grow. We can then put them into you know, an injectable, put them into the patient, or we can turn them into a cell of interest, like those insulin-producing cells, and go from there. How on earth does that relate back to those images of a manufacturing site that I showed you earlier? Well, I talked about that importance of a really clean environment. And as I said, it's because we don't want to contaminate our product of interest. Well, therefore, that means that we have to work, like this person here on the um, left-hand side, in something called a biological safety cabinet. And basically what that does is it provides a clean airflow 
So we can take those flasks, we can open them, we put cells in or we can remove cells. We also need to keep cells warm. We're at 37 degrees, cells like to grow and function at 37 degrees. So we need to create that environment for them. So we put, you can see in the middle of that photo there on the um, right hand side, lots of incubators, basically boxes that are, have a controlled temperature of 37 in them. And that's kind of how it fits into this environment. So I made that sound pretty simple, didn't I? You know, you take some cells, you grow it up, and next thing you know, you can put them back into the patient. We've got the facilities to potentially do this. Okay, there's a few steps, but it doesn't sound too hard. Well, actually, there's still quite a few hurdles to overcome. The first of these is that the cell is the product. Okay, that sounds really obvious. You know, why is that noteworthy? Why is it a challenge even? And it's actually because cells are alive. They respond to their environment. So they're responding to chemical cues, they're responding to physical cues. And that means they can change. And almost without sort of, you know, knowing it, by doing a very subtle thing differently. So having the incubator set to a slightly different temperature, for instance, or maybe not adding quite the right thing in that nutrient-filled liquid, the cells are no longer becoming what we want them to become. And that can be really dangerous. Best case scenario, you put the cells into the patient and it doesn't quite have the therapeutic effect that you're hoping for. It's a bit of a placebo. It's not really doing anything. But worst case scenario, it can actually harm the patient. And the danger is that we sometimes struggle to actually detect whether or not those changes have happened in cells. There's then also this issue of actually creating an off-the-shelf product. Because I said that's kind of the really interesting thing about working with stem cells. This idea that we could take them or the mature cells that we can turn them into and have them sitting on the shelf like a drug that we can then administer into a patient. But that's quite challenging. Again, the cells are alive. You know, actually, how do you, how do you guys normally store drugs? You know, my medicine cabinet just sat in my bathroom. It's room temperature. We sometimes have some drugs that are maybe refrigerated in hospital pharmacies, but, you know, nothing too special. Actually, you know, these cells, they're alive. They're not going to survive at room temperature or in refrigerated conditions for particularly long. So if you look at the literature, in fact, around cell therapies, there's one in particular that I can think of that has a shelf life of 18 hours. So it's made and it has to be back into the patient completely within 18 hours. What happens when the M25 has one of its usual you know, slow to, to not moving at all days, or somebody misses a flight, you know, the surgeon, the patient, whoever. That's a real problem when you've got these really short shelf lives. So we think about alternatives. And the obvious alternative is to freeze the cells, okay? So we kind of put them effectively in stasis. They won't do anything or change in any way. But actually, as you can see from sort of stories like this that came out back in November, um, where I think it was up to four children unfortunately died after where they were transplanted with bone marrow that had been frozen, it can go wrong. These um, children unfortunately passed away, and we think now that it's due to the fact that those frozen cells had changed in some way, and we weren't able to detect that. So researchers are working really hard on improving those detection methods, looking at how we analyze cells, and how we can therefore know more about what we're putting into patients um, as we kind of try and make this something that's more widely used. There's then also a challenge of cost. It's always a challenge, isn't it? You know, a few people have mentioned that already today in sort of quite different contexts. And it's a challenge because, again, we're working in those very um, sort of specialized conditions. Everything has to be ultra pure and ultra clean. And that means that the sort of raw materials that we start with, all those chemicals, have to be, you know, they're quite expensive. But these processes are also really long. And as we all know, time is money. It's a really old saying. And if we take, for instance, the process of how we go from taking a stem cell on the left-hand side right through to creating an insulin-producing cell over here on the right-hand side, and, and please don't worry about all the names and, you know, what these chemicals are, but you can start to see, you know, it's three days and another three days and 14 days. That's a long process. And so that is going to take quite a lot of resource to actually make these cells. So that um, increases the cost. And cost is important, actually, because what we want to be able to do, if these therapies are really going to be cures, is we don't want to make them elitist. We want to actually be able to make things that are affordable, whether it's to individuals through private healthcare systems in, say, the US, or whether it's through national systems like our own NHS um, here in the UK. So researchers are thinking hard about how do we simplify things like this, how these protocols? How do we make them more efficient um, as well? And how do we therefore minimize cost? And finally, there's this issue about actually scaling up processes. So how are we actually going to mass produce the number of cells that we need? Because one of those flasks that I showed you on one of those earlier images contains about mm, three to six million cells normally. Sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Sounds like a huge number. But actually, we need to treat one patient typically 
worth about 100 to 200 million cells. That's a lot of flasks, I can tell you. That's a lot to process. Again, it comes down to time, it comes down to resource. And when we're thinking about reducing cost, is that something we can realistically do? Well, again, we have to think about alternatives. And we have alternatives that are perhaps a little bit more obvious. They're, they're less game-changing, if you like. We can take that flask and we can stack lots on top of each other and make them a little bit bigger. And we end up what we call cell factories. And they're so big, I actually have to move them around with forklift trucks. They're very clean forklift trucks, mind you, but they're forklift trucks nonetheless. Or we can think about using automation. The advantage there is in a system like the one you can see there, on the one hand side, we've got that sort of incubator capacity that's keeping the cells warm. In the middle, you have a robotic arm that basically does all the processes a human will do in terms of how you add cells into a flask, remove cells from a flask, etc. And it can go 24-7, you know, doesn't need to take a break. It's not gonna feel sluggish after slightly too large lunch, you know, Christmas day, all those sorts of things. So there's an advantage there in terms of, okay, you're still dealing with lots of flasks, but it can do it for you. And, and the person shown in the photo there is just um, doing some analysis um, on that day particularly. So that's the other option. Or we can think completely outside the box and we can go, let's get rid of flasks altogether. Are they really the best way forward? And you can think about using something called a bioreactor, where actually, rather than having a flask, you've got little spheres of plastic, um, which is the same material that the flasks are made of, you grow the cells on those, you've got your liquid that's still got all those goodies and nutrients in them, and they sit in basically a tank that's got a stirrer in it. And that's a very different way of thinking about how we're going to grow enough stem cells to either treat the patient directly or potentially um, turn them into another cell type to then treat the patient with. So hopefully what I've done today is I've shown you guys that manufacturing isn't all about working in a warehouse or you know, having a welding torch in your hand, it can be really different but also that there's really good potential in terms of the fact that we can make um, stem cells, um, but that there's still a really you know, great deal of challenges facing us as well. Thank you for listening.